I don't have time to incorporate social emotional learning activities. I barely have time to differentiate math, reading, and writing. Hey there, teachers. Marion Bestfield here with Engaging Curiosity. Thanks so much for joining me here for one of my weekly videos. As a faith-led, retired classroom and SPED teacher, my passion is to support you on your journey to calm classroom chaos and elevate student engagement in ways that free up your time outside of the classroom. Despite my passion for teaching, my transition from learning support into the classroom filled me with fear and trepidation. I knew at least some of my weaknesses and that left me with some imposter syndrome. Fortunately, as a former SPED coordinator, homeschool parent and teacher, literacy interventionist and program coordinator, and most importantly, wife to a high school teacher and mother of two, I brought decades of diverse experiences with me that I'm here to share with you. As I applied everything I learned, classroom management became a breeze and teaching became everything I had believed it could be. I have bolded it all down to five pillars of classroom management upon which everything else rests. To find out more about those five pillars of classroom management, download my free classroom management checklist. The link is in the description below. For now, let's get back to today's topic. So just to be clear on our definitions, social emotional learning activities are any activity that instructs or nurtures social emotional learning or SEL. At the heart of SEL, there are five core competencies. The first one is self-awareness. Self-awareness is the ability to recognize and understand how our emotions impact our behavior. And then once we have that, we head into number two, which is self-management. And with our self-awareness, our minds are, hopefully, open to learning how to regulate emotions, thoughts, and behaviors in a variety of situations. With that, we've got next up with number three is social awareness. And as we learn and grow about ourselves and our impact on others, we are more able to understand and empathize with others from diverse backgrounds and cultures when given the opportunities to learn and grow in that area. And as we grow in our awareness of the other, it impacts our relationship skills, which is number four. We can better become better able to establish and maintain healthy relationships with various groups and individuals. And number five is the responsible decision making. Social awareness is, opens our hearts and minds to others and also hopefully provides discernment on how to make constructive choices about social interactions and our behavior in those social situations. Prior to linking social emotional learning activities as a way to differentiate instruction, let's take a quick review of differentiation. So Dr. Carol Tomlinson suggested four ways to differentiate instruction. Now I'm gonna be honest here. I've seen um, people refer to three principles and generally what I've seen is they've excluded learning environment. Um, I've also seen people say five, and I forget what the fifth is, quite frankly, because Carol Tomlinson um, initiated this principle, these principles, and this concept, and so I kind of stick with her, because I really think they cover the bases. So, number one is content. What is the appropriate level of challenge for a student? So, if a student can't read the word cat, we shouldn't have them on chapter books. However, unfortunately, too often we stop at content and think that um, that our, our uh, curriculum is differentiated, but there's more. Number two is process. Doesn't student learn best visually, auditorially, or kinesthetically? Number three is product. How is a student best able to demonstrate their understanding? Some, I've had students who actually needed a test. They prefer a test. But, you know, there's Lego models, there's um, hanging, things hanging from the, the rafters. I've had a lot of hanging artwork in my classroom. There's games and activities. There's uh, um, readers, theaters. There's all sorts of ways that students can demonstrate their understanding. And um, then, of course, there is the learning environment that I mentioned earlier. So how is the learning environment 
structured to facilitate learning. That's everything from the furniture, because you've got different types of desks, or they can sit on carpets or on couches, as in my classroom, to um, I've seen teachers adjust the lighting in their classroom. And to there's so there's more than that as far as just the physical setup. There's also the culture. The, in, the culture is a huge part of the environment. Have you built classroom community? That contributes to the culture. What the expectations are is also a part of the culture. And um, type of instruction. Are we talking just sage on the stage and just always talking? Are you even taking notes on the board behind you? Are you showing videos? Are you playing games as part of the instruction? Are you having a think pair share as they reflect back on what you've already taught them? So all of those things are different types of um, instruction and they're part of the learning environment that the students are in. And don't forget, the students are a part of the environment because every class, as you know, is very different and you're a part of the environment. You are different from any other teacher that they have or will experience because we are all unique and you're very much a part of the learning environment. So incorporate social emotional learning activities as games to impact the learning environment. Games impact differentiation in very many ways, which is why I'm so grateful that the understanding of their value has really grown. However, the focus here would be on how games as social emotional learning activities impact the learning environment. They are changing the environment each time the students play them and practice essential SEL skills. That doesn't mean that we're talking the learning environment here, but they also impact the content process and product, uh, depending on the games that you choose. The power of play in child growth and development is also so well recognized that there are even municipalities that encourage their citizens to play games to support mental wellness. Games help students to develop skills in the areas of problem solving, decision making, uh, deferring gratification, and dealing with mistakes, which is why they are effective social emotional learning activities. One study of Kahoot, which is a popular multiple choice online quiz game, if you haven't heard of it, I encourage you to look it up. They found that it improved students' attitudes towards learning and boosted their academic scores. So we're talking scores. So we're talking engagement and academic scores. Much of the research on gaming has been focused on online games, um, but there's lots of research supporting board games as well. And because of the relatively recent influx of online games into education, there are still questions around the differences between the impact of concrete games with moving pieces and dice and digital games and what the definition of a game is. Now, I have a broad definition of games, and they are specifically for the classroom. They're a little different from the definition of games for home. So the first criterion is, it, will it move student learning forward? Because, of course, that's relevant in the classroom. Having said that, I mean, I just have games that are available to kids during um, downtime, and the student learning that's moving forward is just social interaction. Um, are the games engaging? This is necessary if I want them to be powerful and effective in the classroom. Does it serve them well socially? Uh, competition, I think, is fair game, and but it needs to be engaging and appropriately leveled and uh, easily managed for all the students. So um, if I've got a little student who is an ELL learner, an English language learner, and the rules are very complex, that might not well serve that student well socially. However, if it's a simple dice and roll game, that could serve them well socially because then they're on a more equal footing, especially in that there may be very little language involved. If it's just a dice, it may make it very equalizing for them and very inclusive for them. Is it easily differentiated and inclusive at the same time? And easily differentiated, so what I create and what I look for are games that are the same and even visually the same, if you look at my color by code, you get the same designs at all the different levels of mental math strategies. And I look for that because that's inclusive. That means that you can be working on a picture of the astronaut and I can be working on the picture of an astronaut, but you're working on make 10 and I'm working on doubles. So is it, um, and that makes it differentiated and inclusive. Is it easy to learn the rules once and then grow and challenge with student ability? 
And again, this allows um, me to minimize behavior and for them to use their time productively. If they have an activity that they've learned at the beginning of the year and then just the skill changes or the content level changes, the challenge, the level of challenge changes, they know what to do and hopefully um, you're doing your formative assessment so they're ready to do it. This engages them and helps to keep them on task. So this is a powerful behavior management strategy. Can you use it for repeated practice? Um, so we know that mastering math facts, sight words, is not a one and done activity. Can they come back to the same or similar activity and practice it over and over again? So for example, again, with my color by code, uh, each math fact strategy, and I do mine so that it's not a whole big, great big jumble, it's make 10 or parts of 10 add doubles or subtract doubles. So that then you've got six designs and further differentiated with a number line and without a number line. So that there's, there's more options there. But can the students do first the picture, if I'm using my space example, can they do the picture of the asteroids? Can they do the picture of the astronaut? Can they do the picture of the rocket ship and so on? Are there enough different designs that when they go through that station for a week or two weeks or however long you want to space it out, they're practicing that mental math strategy repeatedly, but in an engaging way so that they can, they can um, continue and they know the activity. So uh, can they do it independently? And again, have you instructed it? I mentioned this earlier. This is part of the behavior management strategy. So do they know how to, um, is it easy to store? So for example, color by code is just a simple strip of paper that you pull out of a filing system or a folder that you would have there. Can, I've got board games that again are on an eight and a half by 11 and then they've got worksheets that go with them and that would be in a file. Are they task cards that are in a little box that are right there and they know how to pull it out? Have they got all the tools and resources there? Is it easy to prep and differentiate and lay out in such a way that the students can do it independently? And is it concrete rather than digital? Digital, Especially for the primary grades, I am a fan of the concrete games. It's just so much more real concrete. However, uh, I also believe in digital games. My kids had Fridays on computer activities as one third of the block. And I felt that those were relevant and appropriate. They had a little bit of computer time for reading as well. Um, I just, first of all, they needed to learn those skills. They learned, needed to learn mastery of uh, the keyboard and starting at that age when they're more um, flexible mentally. I felt it was doing a service to my colleagues in later grades by teaching them how to sign on independently. And so we took a good bit of time to do that. I think teaching them how to do a self-checking activity. I have a couple of those resources and they will be growing in my store. Uh, serves the student for immediate feedback, for engagement. And it serves the teacher because you're getting a formative assessment and um, greater student engagement and independence and less work for you because you're not having to do the marking. So there is value in the digital games, but I tend to focus mostly on the concrete games because of the young age, if nothing else. The resources I create for teachers are designed to align with my definition of a game. So just taking a moment to do a bit of a plug, I suppose. They are designed to enable teachers to create engagement and support students in their academic, mental, and emotional abilities. I can guarantee you that in a primary classroom, teaching social emotional skills is not a one and done activity. I'm pretty confident that is true in all levels, but I can speak definitively to the primary grades. In addition to social emotional curriculums that are either chosen by the teachers or distributed by schools or districts, we need social emotional learning activities to help students to make deeper connections in their understanding and to practice their social emotional skills. There are other games and activities in my store and they will continue to grow in number, of course. They are more than just the Make 10 Math Strategy. And if you're interested, you can find the links below to these resources in my store. Having now identified uh, how social emotional learning activities help to differentiate instruction, now let's look at how games impact the principles of social emotional learning. 
Okay, so first up is self-awareness. We mentioned it earlier. Okay, so what I'm doing here is showing you that that's one of the five core principles of social emotional learning. And now let's attach that to the games and see how they weigh up. Okay, so with self-awareness, games are building a growth mindset. By encouraging reflection and celebrating efforts, students develop a positive attitude towards learning and resilience in facing challenges. Of course, they may need to be nurtured and supported in developing that attitude. Uh, and that's the opportunity that we have with games. Self-management. Uh, activities that combine math with creative or physical tasks help students manage stress and frustration. Social awareness. As social awareness grows, students become aware of how they manifest their feelings, impacts their relationships. Too much gloating or poor sportsmanship does not make us a lot of friends. And relationship skills. Of course, working together in a variety of settings helps students develop communication, empathy, and cooperation. And then there's the responsible decision making. With appropriate boundaries created by solid classroom expectations, solid SEL instruction, awareness, and repeated practice, students will have the tools to learn how to make responsible decisions that work both for themselves and for others. Games move students along the spectrum of social development. This impacts the learning environment as well as each of the other principles of differentiation. As a teacher, when we facilitate students as they learn together in a game, we are shielding students from some of that overwhelming sense of vulnerability, which can be the insurmountable challenge in making new friendship. The game is the focus of the attention, and for the quieter members of our crew, that helps them to relax and join in. Games are so much more than a break or reward for good behavior or even an early finisher activity. They're an essential part of an engaging, effective, well-rounded math program and one of the essential social emotional learning activities for your classroom. One final thank you for sharing your time with me today. I want to encourage you that growth for a teacher is just like growth for a student, one step